Hello, friends, and welcome again to Behind the Bastards. I'm Robert Evans, your host on yet another journey into the life and mind of one of the worst people in all of history. My guest today is Caitlin Gill. Hey, that's me. Caitlin Gill is a comedian. Yeah, presumably. Some, some would argue that. But and yes. you're involved in a television production yes. that's happening now? Uh, it happened, and it's about to come out July 11th. T- tune in to True TV's Misfits and Monsters. Bobcat Goldthwait made a fun TV show, and I bet you're going to like it. So watch it when it's on. So on this episode of the show, I will be talking to a, a, a vastly more accomplished comedian <laughs> and uh, reading a story about a bad person in history. <laughs> I live in uh, a backyard. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we all live in yards, okay? <laughs> Let's not... <laughs> Just bragging that yours is a backyard. <laughs> it's true. I, do, I have moved back from the front yard. That yeah. feels good, yeah. you know? Yeah. I've been living on a porch for a while, and it is uh, not ideal. <laughs> um, speaking of porches, uh, what do you know about the Cambodian mass killings in the uh, the 1970s? Uh, I know that or it is 80s. one of the most 90s. brutally mm-hmm. depressing aspects of history you can look at. Wasn't mm-hmm. it like... 50s forward? It was long and really well, bad. It, there was a lot of shit going on from the 50s forward. It's uh, like a million plus. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the the mass killing started in 1975, went through to like 78 or 79, about three and a half years, the Khmer Rouge was in power. What do you know about the, the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot? Like, um, I mean, some. I have a political science degree and I paid attention in those classes, but that was 15 years ago. So my updated history, not so great. But in the past, I uh, was disgustingly fascinated. It seems like one of the most uh, cruel oh, yeah. regimes that has ever uh, gotten to spend some time in power. Real bad, real, real bad. Real bad people. And it was one of those things. So when we started this podcast, you know, I had some some people that I clearly had plans for. I wanted to talk about Hitler's favorite young adult novels and Saddam Hussein's erotic memoirs and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and then there were people where it was like, yeah, we're probably going to do a Pol Pot episode at some point. But I didn't really know anything more than like what I'd learned in high school about him, which is like, yeah, he killed like a million and a half people. They had people with glasses murdered for some reason, yes. like, and that's that's the end of the. And you figure it's like the same story with a guy like Hitler or Stalin, where it was just some asshole who wound up in charge and just started murdering the groups of people they hated. And so I I, I didn't really know much about Pol Pot, and I started reading into the story recently, and I read a great book called Pol Pot: The Anatomy of Terror, and then that sent me down a, a whole reading hole. And anyway, I wound up. Uh, realizing that the most interesting character, the most terrible person uh, behind all of this, is not Pol Pot himself. Uh, and instead, it's a different guy, a different person entirely, Prince Norodom Sihanouk. Have you ever heard of that? I have not heard of this prince. Well, uh, Samdech Priya Norodom Sihanouk was born in Phnom Penh, Cambodia on October 31st, 1922. Uh, he was a member of both of Cambodia's two leading royal families, the Sisawaths and the Norodoms but he was not born as the heir apparent. So Cambodia has like a a different sort of way of appointing their kings. Nowadays, there's like a royal council that sort of is a mix of elected and unelected people who votes on the new king. Back when he was born, the French were in charge of Cambodia, and Mm -hmm. so they would appoint new kings when the king died. Isn't that Um, convenient? Yeah. So Nordam was an only child, uh, and since this was the 20s, his parents were terrified he was going to die on them. They consulted an astrologer, which was a normal thing to do at the time. Like everybody in Cambodia consulted astrologers. This would have been like right after stuff. the Russians thought it was a good idea to talk to Rasputin, right? Yeah, this is like yeah. Right in that this era is within when, five like, years of that. Medicine yeah. is almost happening, but mystics are still like, maybe I'm medicine. Yeah, it's and, like you get a flu, and your family's like, well, I guess that's it for you. That's, and a that, single yeah. prince, an only child prince, can't have any appearance of injury or illness anyway. So yeah. you get real creepy about how, you know, it's a lot of secrets really early. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you're talking to mystics. Something's wrong with that kid. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It bleeds a lot or it like can't breathe good or I don't the, know. They were just worried. And the astrologer. Was he a lumpy baby? You have to assume. Yeah. They're all lumpy yeah. babies. Every baby is lumpy. How are you the only child and not in line for a throne? Well, he was in line for it, but it wasn't a guarantee. So he was like, you know, you've got a certain number of kids who could could be. Okay. Because there's like, there's the royal families are big. And so the prince are like, okay, well, there's like nine or 10 kids we get to pick from. Um, And he was obviously like, it wasn't guaranteed, but he was in the running. So his parents were very concerned about him. And they take him to an astrologer. And the astrologer warned that if he was raised by his mom and dad, he would die early. So as a young boy, Noradam was raised by his grandmother, Madam Chow Hun Pat. She was. I feel uh, like you're describing a very bleak version of the movie Big. Yes, <laughs> that's this entire story. Uh, there is a giant. Oh, good. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be great. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking about Big Fish. 
Oh, Big Fish is, Very yeah. different films. Yeah, I just like that, like, I don't let him grow up with my parents anymore. I want to be a big <laughs> kid right now. Only a very dark, evil version. Yeah. Um, no Zoltan, it's like a, it's like a source, of, you know, an astrologer yeah. screaming at your parents. Boy, I really got that movie wrong. Because uh, you're talking about the Tom Hanks film. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about the yeah the mm. piano. I'm talking about a, a Cambodian dictator You did bring up another one of history's great monsters, but we haven't done our Tom Hanks episode <laughs> yet. Um, but he definitely belongs Oh, the, the tea show. you could spill. Yeah. Honey. <laughs> uh, so his grandmother's really religious. Uh, she's a Buddhist, known for giving a lot of money to monks, uh, which was you know pretty popular at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. She dies when he's a young boy, um, and... Immediately after he she dies, he's ordained as a monk for exactly 24 hours. Um, that was like a thing in Cambodian culture where everybody was, and it was really common for like if your family had any money at all, they'd send you away to learn how to be a monk for a little while. So it's not like the universal church that you sign up for just to marry your friends. Or it whatever? is. It is for him. So for normal cam, so for the for the prince. Because he might be the king, anytime you might be a leader, they send you off to be a monk for exactly a day, um, just so he can say like, no, he's enlightened. He's been a monk. Like he's he's a he's a monk king sort of thing. That was important. If you were a normal Cambodian who was like middle class or up, you'd also be a monk. But you, monk, but you'd be there for months. And the training for non king monks was brutal. Here's how a normal Cambodian at the time explained like what the actual monks went through. If you came to the Wat as a novice, you had to study for three months before you were allowed to wear the robe. You were taught the etiquette of a monk, how to put on the robe, how to speak, how to walk, how to put your palms together to show respect, and you were given a thrashing if you didn't do as they said. If you didn't walk correctly, you were beaten. You had to walk quietly and slowly without making any sound with your feet, and you weren't allowed to swing your arms. You had to move serenely. You had to learn by heart in Pali the rules of conduct and the Buddhist precepts so that you could recite them without hesitation. If you hesitated, you were beaten. So, Man. Yeah. That's like getting an honorary degree from like the worst university. Yeah, yeah. Like Cobra Kai University. <laughs> everybody's everybody's getting beaten except for the prince who shows up for one day and he gets to be a monk straight away. Um, so as a young child, the prince goes to school in Saigon over in Vietnam and then he goes to France. Uh, he gets a, a really nice Western education. He develops a love for the arts and for French cooking. His mother nicknames him Tool or Tubby. On this, at this point... I'm on his side. I get it. France is pretty irresistible. France is I mean, irresistible. And your mom calls done, you fat. If you're just like a portly, rich Cambodian prince, honestly, just kick it in France, baby. Mm-hmm. Like, if that's what you're into, then be there. There's the a lot food of... is great in both places, but the... so different. Yeah. Go be, go be a tubby in France. Yeah. So he spends a lot of time as a young man being a fat kid in France uh, while other young Cambodian kids are getting beaten to learn how to be monks. So, so far I'm um, just jealous. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's probably jealous. <laughs> um, so in 1941, his grandfather, who was the current king, dies. And the French, you know, have to pick from the options in the royal families. And in 1941, they decide to bet on Noradam Sihanouk because he seemed like the choice who'd give them the least grief. Uh, this is what he looked like on the day he was ordained. And we'll have these pictures up on the Behind the Bastards website. Oh, he's website. not tubby. There's no reason to shame him. Yeah, you see, I feel like weight, this is what makes me feel like his mom is probably giving him a complex because that's not a fat kid. He does have evil eyes. I want, like, it, when you look at the picture, it looks like, even just printed out on computer paper, I feel like he is across a bar. And like <laughs> raising his eyebrow at me. There's something He's that his eyebrow is doing. He's been staring at you for a while. Yeah, it's like a painting that yeah. looks at you when you move across the room. This is the guy that leers at you from across the bar, only in in photograph form. And he, but he's kind of hot. Like, I'm not mad he's looking at me, except I know he's trouble, you know? Yeah, and if you knew that his mom had called him fat his whole childhood, you'd yeah, probably gotta, assume, yes. like, oh, there's some darkness going on Yes, there's there. issues. I don't want, I mean, this is a good time for me to assess that he's kind of handsome and say that out loud before I hear about all the horrible things that he did. He is kind of Just remember, handsome. handsome people can be really bad. Mm-hmm. Bad people. Handsome people with, it has to be said, fabulous hats. Beautiful people are evil. Mm-hmm. Never forget. Yeah, you can tell by his cheekbones that he's dangerous. <laughs> so in 1941, the French government that appoints him isn't really France. It's Vichy France. Mm-hmm, you know, the Germans mm-hmm, had mm-hmm. conquered them. So he was appointed king by the puppet government for the Nazi occupiers. Their leader, Marshal Pétain, became the leader of Cambodia as well. The children who grew up in Cambodia's public schools at the time were educated to Pétainist standards, which emphasized unity, order, and labor. The city was seen as the incarnation of all evil, and peasant life was highlighted as the soul of the nation. One of the children in these schools was a guy named Saloth Sar, who would grow into a guy named Pol Pot. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Just a little bit of foreboding there. Um, so Cambodia is in an awkward position during World War II. Pol Pot came from a much different social status, not a prince. School not kid, a prince. Normal kind, dude. kind of upper middle class. Okay, right. All yeah, right. not rich, but but his family oh, was doing okay. Yeah. Oh, he's the whiniest. 
Yeah, he comes from a, a pretty bougie little background. Um, but he had to do the full monk training, too. So he's the guy getting the shit kicked out of him by monks and learning about how cities are evil in school. Yes. While the actual king is flying to France and developing a complex because his mom calls him fat. <laughs> So Cambodia is in an awkward position during World War II. Uh, France is technically an Axis ally at this point, like the P- mm-hmm. Vichy France, but the Japanese eventually wound up conquering Cambodia just a couple of months after the prince gets coronated. So Sihanouk now becomes Japan's puppet and proclaims Cambodian independence. Obviously, that didn't last longer than 1945. As soon as the war's over, Sihanouk starts advocating for more independence from France. He introduced universal male suffrage to his country and press freedom, and he establishes an elected parliament. So, so far... He seems pretty enlightened for a king in Cambodia in the 40s. If you're a Cambodian dude. If you're a Cambodian dude. Well, you can't just go from zero to letting women vote. You can't just go from zero to human rights for humans. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I know I'll That's, go. Yeah. Bleeding rag feminist over here. What are you, huh? Huh? Sorry. I mean, it was this was 25 years after we decided women could vote in America. I just love the phrase universal yeah, male, male suffrage. suffrage. Like, you don't get to universal and then immediately qualify, qualify universal to specifically mm-hmm. what It's just a funny, it's universal a funny turn of people phrase. people I like suffrage yes that's yeah. honestly, all the people yes. i like get to vote yes yeah. yeah you're all universally invited to my birthday party except only 10 of you can come yeah but he's woke by 40s standards <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yeah he is woke if you lower the bar yeah. yes yeah. correct so so our 40s woke king is uh <laughs> a lot of cambodians at the time the ones who were living in like cities and towns who were educated and kind of plugged into the world it probably seemed like they were slowly sort of joining modernity Mm -hmm. um, and heading Mm -hmm. towards the kind of system England has where you've got a king but the king's kind of a just a figure to look pretty yeah look pretty we care about their weddings and shit but like that's kind of what people were hoping for what a lot of people were hoping for but it's very different outside of the cities so in rural Cambodia probably about a quarter of Cambodian peasants of the country like the real deep Mm -hmm. peasants had never used money at all in their lives um, they, Burning Man. I'm just that was terrible. I yeah, it's kind of like Burning Man, but with subsistence but farming. With, yeah, 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 but yes, yeah. yeah. But if you mm-hmm. don't farm enough rice, you starve. Yeah, and uh, you didn't spend seven thousand dollars to get there, and you don't have like a dust mask, and there's no glow sticks. Yeah, but well, otherwise, there's, there's totally probably, Burning Man. Otherwise, we have to assume there's glow sticks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I love it if somebody who's never used currency in their entire life and has just lived <laughs> from the land that they're on for generations. And you happen to be passing by, and they're just glow sticking <laughs> with like. Where did you get those? A silent rave that's been going on for a millennia that yeah. we just didn't know about. It's a thousand year old rave. <laughs> um, it's like the thousand year old egg, only so much more fun. <laughs> So the king's not a figurehead to the peasants. He's a, he's kind of he's seen he's seen as sort of a figurehead in the cities. To the peasants, he's semi divine. Sure. Uh, I'm going to read a description of royal court life from that book, Pol Pot: The Anatomy of Terror, that I think sort of sets up kind of how the king is seen by the country people. Each spring, crowds gathered to watch the royal oxen plow the sacred furrow, and all of those things are capitalized, Mm -hmm. from which the king's astrologer would divine whether or not there would be plenty or famine in the year ahead. And at Tang Tok, the king's birthday, the provincial governors came to pay homage. Royal protocol was draconian. In his palace, if no longer in the colonized state over which he reigned, the king was still an absolute ruler, the master of life, venerated by the populace as a sacred quasi-divine figure. At royal audiences, the princes, mandarins, and other dignitaries crouch on all fours, with their knees and elbows on the floor and their hands raised together before their heads. The king sits above them, enthroned on a dais, sitting cross-legged like an Indian idol. When he enters or leaves, all present prostrate themselves at three times. No one has the right to speak unless the king addresses him, and no one may publicly disagree with anything the king says. So you're already seeing sort of a disconnect between you've got the people in the cities who are like listening to the radio, they're watching TV, they're getting the newspapers, and then you've got the people who... Yeah, they're on room springer, and then yeah. there's people still on the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the king makes the rain come, <laughs> um, which is not like a joke. That's right, like, right, that's right, like right, a widespread right. belief. Yes. So there, there's already a big disconnect here. Um, so the Khmer language, uh, and the Khmer are like the, the majority mm-hmm. people of Cambodia, has its own special sub-language for how to talk to the king. So there's like a separate dictionary of words you just use to refer to the king and his family. The king was seen as impossibly high above even his high ministers, who were known non-jokingly as, quote, we who carry the king's excrement on our heads. So that's... I mean, it's jokingly. Yeah. 
Come no, on, no. that is a little bit tongue in cheek. Like, I, yeah, I, you, we got your shit on our head, buddy. Like, yeah, this is a little bit. I'm gonna ask a you a little bit in a few more pages if you think that was jokey or if you think that's. I'm not just, saying it wasn't literal, even, yeah. but it's got a. There's a wink in there somewhere. There's yeah, a jester in the court. Yeah, there, 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 there might be a, a couple of winks. Um, I'll eat my words later. I won't eat the king's feces, but I will. I, I'll be happy to eat my words. Yeah. So this is you can imagine. You know, guy grows up with his mom calling him Tubby, and now nobody's allowed to. Argue argue with him and he's philosophically shitting on I was a tubby kid happily. we do not deserve power until we go through and unpack our trauma you can't you can't hand uh you know, you can take the fat off the kid. You can't take the fat kid out of the fat kid. No. You just because there's this like, no. I'm an only child who was tubby. Trust, yeah. trust. Yeah. Trust. Oh, yeah. I, I grew up as a fat kid. And, you know, it's one of those things where when you see a fat kid who loses weight, like that's someone who didn't deal with their trauma. Who's just like trying to control themselves and their body through like, there's something dark in there. Is all I'm saying. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not, you have to shine the light in your own darkness. Yeah. And you know it, whatever happened to you in the bathroom, in the locker room, or on the playground, eventually you have to shine a little light on it, or you become a dictator if yeah. you happen to be a prince. Yeah. Well, what he ha- winds up doing is so much I just became like so a bad weirder. assistant manager. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's what most people do, but it depends on your access. It's yeah. where you start from. Usually you go for a tiny amount of power. Yeah. But he, he kind of got on I'm the- I'm mad with my moderate amount of power. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking old-fashioned kings here. Notre Dame's grandfather was famous for having a gigantic uh, harem made up of beautiful local ladies. By the late 30s, he was too old and sickly to make use of them. Um, so these ladies weren't allowed to go out and live their own lives. They got frustrated and things got weird. <laughs> um, one of the ladies courted by the old king was a girl named Ryung. Uh, she was the older sister to Saloth Tsar, the guy who became Pol Pot. He was about 15 at this point in time, and his sister's position meant he got to spend some time hanging around the royal palace. Since he was just 15, he was even allowed to hang out with the king's courtesans, and they would fondle him. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So that's Pol Pot's 15-year-old childhood is like hanging out in the royal palace and getting like like literally masturbated by the king's- uh, Bored, uh, horny courtesans. Yeah, yeah. exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. So just You're trying to keep in like mind- You're describing like a the... very high class Charles Manson existence. Yeah, that's yeah. That's Charles Manson's mom, you know, bit yeah. of a- uh, she's a girl about town. I think that's actually how he described her. Um, oh, boy. And, and, you know, he got traded for beer, but- uh, you know, yeah, who the man who became Pol Pot just got jerked off by a bunch of royal courtesy. It's the same yeah. but different. It is the same but different. Apparently, it, that's my job here today. Here's something that's like what you're talking about, but not. Well, no, but it's good. It's good to point out that this this story that starts with yeah, yeah started it never in a ends different well. country in a yeah. different class level, and it is it's also a bad ending. It's, yeah, this it, is not a good jump. It's not a good thing to do to a 15 year old. 15 year olds maybe get, like if you happen to get rubbed off when you were 15, congratulations, and I bet you're fine. Uh, I hope for most of you it is a positive. Positive memory. If you are a fifteen-year-old being jerked off by a royal harem, that that is going to change your path. Yeah, you, that's, it's that's, gonna change your path. That's different than like you're 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 dating somebody in high school, and right? Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. We you're either all... gonna be an interesting sex sex educator or apparently a dangerous dictator. Yeah, yeah, and probably the second. <laughs> so yeah, this is the sort of environment, cultural environment, Noradam Sahanak comes to power in. Um, you know, he's 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 the king, and so he's he's dealing with both. Like you've got these people in the cities who they're supposed to treat him like a god, but they they don't because mm-hmm. he's just this. They they know he's just like this guy, and they're trying to be like, well, let's be a, a normal country that doesn't worship the king. But then he's got these people in the uh, in the sticks who to whom he's literally a, a, a deity. So you you can see how this would cause. Some conflicts uh, within the king and within the country. I feel like for any crafty con man, crisis is opportunity. This is a great, you know, you wink and nod on one side and you and you get to grease the other wheels. Well, speaking of crisis, by the time the king comes to power in the late 40s, uh, well, he comes to power in 41, but the mm-hmm. time he's really getting used to things, the Cold War starts kicking off. And his neighbors are all dealing with, you know, communism. You've got Vietnam with this this communist revolt against the French going on right now. And at first it seemed like Cambodia was immune to communism. Um, so in traditional Marxist theory, the revolution begins within the laboring class, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. the factory mm-hmm. workers who get fed up with serving the needs of capital. In the 40s and 50s, Cambodia had like a couple of thousand actual laborers in the whole country. Most countries subsistence farmers. Um, they didn't really give a fuck about capitalism or socialism. This is because neither had anything to do with their lives. They worked at most about six months a year to cover their basic needs. 
uh, and they were all Theravada Buddhists. And Theravada Buddhism places no value on acquiring wealth. And therefore, number one, there was no cultural need to acquire wealth, and there just wasn't a lot to buy. Mm -hmm. um, King Sihanouk liked to tell a story about an American aid expert who visited Cambodia in the 50s and convinced some villagers to start using modern fertilizer. They doubled their harvest yields in a year, and the aid worker came back the next year and was surprised to see that each farmer had only grown half as many crops this the next year. Um, he didn't understand why they wouldn't want to produce twice as much, but clearly the Cambodians were like, no, we can farm half as much and make the same amount of food and work even less. Um, so basically yeah. they're the smartest people in the yes, world. Yes, yeah, uh, they really got it right, <laughs> They're, really, they're yeah. really nailing it in like the late 40s. Can I um, ask a dumb historical question from yeah, a little bit farther back? For that sure. I feel like I should know in terms of like the Silk Road and the spice trade. I, Cambodia has always been in a significant position for colonizers, but what... Is there a product that everybody was hungry for from the outside? Like, why did my people, the Scots, get on a boat to go there? I come from thieves and plunderers. Wait, the so Scots I went assume... to Cambodia? I'm not aware no, no, of this no. part. I mean, I, in a, uh, I'll take a step. In the broader sense of why people leave the tiny rock that they were on to go get something better from outside, pepper or a spice or a mineral, why were people coming from places in the West to Cambodia? What were they plundering? What were they taking? I mean, so it, it, it's one of those things. Cambodia, or is it most just of in what the they produced was rice. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Cambodia's history is heavily based on sort of conflicts between Vietnam. Right. Like Vietnam is their traditional enemy because Vietnam's like the big regional power. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of like more or less conflict constant sort of power struggles between China and Vietnam and Cambodia kind of winds up in the middle. And of course, during World War II, they wound up in the middle between everybody and the Japanese. Mm -hmm. But like they're never, nobody- More like, about position on the map than resources it, within. Exactly. Because okay. they're, 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 like they're not like a major industrial power, obviously. There's not like giant gold mines or anything. Like it's, it's a country of like small farmers who just want to make enough food to keep their families alive. I just know that by the 40s, a bunch of economies were kind of closing up to do that. Most of their people would have been subsistence farmers, so it made sense for the economy to stay more closed than to invite in trade, since there would always be such an imbalance. That, yeah. Uh, and it's th there's an interesting period of history when uh, countries uh, were, were more isolated and fascinating things happened in their history within that bubble because Cambodians weren't out buying Ritz crackers. They were... You know, everything that happened is internally. Their history is inside the bubble along with their economy. Yeah. So it's just kind of interesting to pick out and figure out what people were busy doing. And it's things like growing less crops because yeah. you didn't need to grow as you many. you don't need it. Which is fucking great. But one of the things they also have going on is uh, Angkor Wat is in Cambodia, mm -hmm. which is this crazy, gigantic, beautiful, like, complex of, of, of massive buildings that was built during the Khmer Empire, which had fallen hundreds of years before this point. But so that's... King Sihanouk's looking at that and saying, like, our people used to be great and build great gigantic things, and I, I have to figure out some way to make us into a significant slaves. power. The answer the is world. always slaves. Slaves are always the answer to why people made big cool stuff. Well, it's always slaves. Slaves you, are you, always you, the terrible answer. You, you, you just spoiled a lot of the story. But, uh, uh, <laughs> that is not a spoiler. No, it's How not a spoiler. How could that be a spoiler? Hmm, um, evil king wants to build something big. There's no gap here. There, that is a straight line. So we're going to get back to what exactly this not yet evil, but uh, uh, definitely evil king is going to do later. So we're going to continue talking about this evil or not yet evil king in a minute. But right now, we have to advertise some products uh, because- the capitalist gods. Yeah, yeah. None of us are Cambodian people. We, we will all work much harder in order to purchase uh, things which we can fill our homes with. So grab, dumb -dumbs. grab a box of money and a bag of money and a suitcase of money. And, and some dum dums. And some dum dums. Buy some dum dums. This show's official sponsor is not dum dums, but we're advertising them anyway. And now some other things. So, yeah, we're back. Hi. And we're talking about Cambodia and its culture at the time when uh, King Noadam Sahanuk is, uh, is sort of coming into power, the late 40s, the early 50s. Um, and he's frustrated because he wants to modernize his country. Uh, he wants to make it, you know, great again. Uh, and the people just kind of want to farm and not get involved in any of the conflicts raging around them. So there's there's sort of this little, like, it's not really a, a huge conflict yet, but you can, you can see some groundwork laid mm -hmm. where uh, the king, you know, wants to open things up more to the world and the people are just sort of like, but, you know... Mm -hmm. 
yeah. we got rice. <laughs> like, I feel fine. Uh, so yeah, there was a communist movement afoot in Cambodia in the late 40s and early 50s, but it was dominated by the Viet Minh, by the Viet Minh who um, you might guess from the name were Vietnamese and not Cambodian. Right. Um, yeah, this made them not super popular among the Cambodians because again, there's this history of Vietnam mm-hmm. being sort of this domineering power over Cambodia. So, so far, it doesn't look like the communists are going to gain uh, a big foothold in, in Cambodia. Um, the problem is that the country occupies a really sweet position from the point of view of someone trying to smuggle weapons into Vietnam in order to fight the French. So it was important to Vietnam to have backing in Cambodia. Um, they weren't really successful in spreading communism, but they had some success working with an anti-colonial rebel movement called the Khmer Isarak. And the Isarak aren't really communists. They, they're more Democrats. They want uh, Cambodia to like vote for leaders, and they don't want the French to be in their fucking country anymore. Mm-hmm. And they're not super communist, but they're willing to take guns from the communists in order to try to kick out the French. So from a fighting standpoint, the Isarak look a lot like our conception of the Viet Cong. They're jungle warriors who carry out hit-and-run attacks against the military and wage an endless guerrilla war. I'm not going to try to bog you down in details of Cambodian politics at this time, although they are fascinating. What's important for the story is that the Khmer Isarak are the guys trying to uproot the French and thus King Sihanouk. You know, they call him a traitor and a collaborationist for sort of working with the French. Um, what era, how far have we moved in history? We're from? in the early 50s, okay. 51, 52. And this is the point at time at which the conflict between the Isaraks and the French starts to really get bloody. Mm-hmm. There's a, a quote in the, the book Pol Pot that I mentioned earlier from a Shang Song, who is a Cambodian senator today, uh, who remembered how in his village in the Takeo province, the Isaraks would decapitate victims and stuff their stomachs with grass. Uh, when we as children were fishing in the ponds, he remembered, we would find severed heads in the water. It didn't bother us. We were used to it. We'd yank them out by the hair and throw them aside. That was around 1949. Let Arby's deal with it. Yeah. So things are getting Cambodia in the late 40s to early 50s is transitioning from like this mostly peaceful place to being sort of increasingly racked with civil conflict. The Isarak are pretty brutal guys. Uh, many of their leaders wore what were known as kunkrak or smoke children, which are amulets made from mummified fetuses that were said to stop bullets. Uh, the colonial soldiers were no better. One former government soldier, these are like local Cambodian soldiers recruited from the cities, uh, but fighting under French command. One former government soldier described his unit's work as, quote, we would move into villages, kill the men and women who had not already fled, and then engage in individual tests of strength, which consisted of grasping infants by the legs and then pulling them apart. So things are getting bad in Cambodia in the early 50s. And the king sees the writing on the wall, which is that this rebel movement, like, he, he he's a smart guy. He's already guessed from the start of the fighting between the French and the Vietnamese that the, the Vietnamese are going to kick the French out. And he knows that the Vietnamese are also going to continue funding the rebels in Cambodia to kick the French out, which means that he's going to get overthrown and probably ripped apart by a mob if he doesn't figure out some cunning way to get his country free of France without letting the rebels win. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So Now that is a dilly of a pickle. That is a dilly of you a know pickle. What I'm saying? That is a dilly. How would you solve that problem? Well, slaves. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I You're just always dropping back to slaves. <laughs> Well, at nationalism is a is a pretty easy trick at that stage, or something like really? it, where uh, you know you've got you have the former loyalty of those who are worshiping you, and you've got the uh, up and coming gleaming cities that are looking to build and grow. Um, you know, close the ranks and make it about being Cambodian, not French or Vietnamese. You know what you would have made pretty good dictator you would have made a great king of cambodia in the <laughs> 1950s you would have nailed being king of cambodia in the 1950s i don't know that is a pretty delicate dance that's some tough marketing you'd need the right people this but. is a delicate dance and so spoiler alert, king norodom sahanak as i think people you can't will spoiler agree. alert history it's yeah. just like hey you didn't read this spoiler yet. alert for a thing that millions of <laughs> yes. people know uh, <laughs> uh he's definitely a bastard like he belongs on this show but he's kind of, he, it's one of those, like, he, he is a dancer. This whole story is him dancing around. And there's, yeah. there's an I aspect like of it where you're like. I feel like this entire era of, like, up yeah. until, like, well, right now, up until the 50s, he's, like, from the 1900 to 1950, there are a whole bunch of royal courts yeah. just, like, whipping and dodging. Yeah. Like, just, like, oh, God, we don't know how to, <laughs> oh, boy. 
toy. <laughs> it's like a stupid gif of kids on a like you know in a playground, a little whirly gig thing yeah. where everybody's it's spinning too hard and everybody's trying to hold on. They and all then, like, know what happened one in by Russia. one. They all yeah. fly off. Fat yeah. kid goes last, but you know he's gonna go. You know he's gonna go. But this fat kid's gonna hang on. They hang on tight, and some are still clinging. But yeah. uh, it's it, it it's just a period. No time in monarchical history is boring. They're weird. Monarchies are very weird. But there's yeah. that period in history seems to be so volatile where they just couldn't keep up with the pace of social change everywhere, either backwards or forwards. Yeah. And I, I'm sure he's dancing along with the rest. He's dancing. So you remember when he comes to power, one of the first things he does is he lets the men vote and he establishes a parliament that has you know some power. So he's basically he's sharing power with the parliament. And he has a lot of power. Like he's not like the king of England is now where there's no, or I guess they haven't had a, you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's, not, he's not just a figurehead. But there's a parliament. They have power. And they're right now dominated by the Democratic Party. Um, which was kind of like the Democratic Party here, kind of a general liberalish party who included just sort of a melange of, of left wing and centrist people. And their big thing is they want to be an actual democracy. So they're they're kind of ideologically more or less in line with the Isarac, but they don't want to do it violently. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanna they wanna peacefully sort of proceed to being decolonized and whatnot. So the Isaraks, meanwhile, are a little bit further to the left. Some of them are outright communists. Their most popular leader is a guy named Sun Nok Than whose goal was to get the Democrats to back him in pushing the French authorities out of Cambodia. So he's trying to get his rebel movement to ally with the people in power and sort of force a coup against the government. Um, And he's one of the guys attacking the king for being a puppet of the French. So this all comes to a head in June of 1952, when the king, aged 30, decides it's time for him to jump into politics for the first time. Um, because he'd sort of tried to be above factional politics. You know, you've got the Cambodian right wing and you've got the Democrats, and he doesn't really weigh in. So he finally decides to weigh in, and he gave a speech attacking the Democrats and whining that people had dared to say that collaborating with the French wasn't cool. This prompts an uprising of right-wing Cambodians in the city who take to the streets and advocate for the destruction of the current Democrat-dominated party in power. Sihanouk calls up French troops, Moroccans actually, in the middle of the night on June 9th, he dissolves the government, assumes emergency powers, and declares himself prime minister. So, well, there you go. I forgot I'm out of emergency powers. Yeah, Don't well, manipulate your public. You Look gotta, inside. Every now and then you create an emergency that you didn't have to You then have to assume emergency powers for. Well, yeah. And it was just a coincidence. Wag that, that dog, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. So he announces that he's launching a royal crusade to gain Cambodian independence within three years. He bans all political meetings in Phnom Penh, and he has French soldiers and armored vehicles fill the streets to make sure nobody talks about politics other than the politics that he wants to Honestly, talk about. Honestly, that sounds refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, no more just armed men stopping you from talking about the government. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, so the French, in spite of the fact that he says Cambodia needs to be independent from France, the French are more or less on his side because their basic idea is that democracy in Cambodia was a mistake. Cambodians aren't ready to be voting because they're going to vote to kick the French out. (laughs) And only a king can keep things peaceful. Uh, The Republicans in the capital, and by that I mean people who want a republic, not Mm -hmm, the conservatives, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, because the conservatives are all about this. Uh, The Republicans in the capital aren't happy. Sihanouk's crackdown inspires protests. Uh, In in November of 1952, there's a big strike by students in Phnom Penh and several towns. King Sihanouk tells them all to get back to class, but instead a bunch of them hole up in the National Assembly, which is the parliament building. Monks came out to protest and argue that the king was in fact a dick. Uh, in January of 53, there are some grenade attacks on schools in Phnom Penh. Uh, Philip Short, author of Anatomy of a Nightmare, says that these attacks were either from the rebels to provoke the king into brutal reprisals or just ordered by the king so that he could justify a crackdown. And it seems like it's probably the second one. So he has some people start throwing grenades into political gatherings so that he can basically crack down on everybody. So he gives a speech and says, from now on, any individual or political party that opposes my policies will be declared a traitor to the nation and punished accordingly. The king is supported in this by his mom, who'd once called him Tubby. She hated democracy and thought the idea of people voting was a deliberate insult to her personally. That is Uh, hilarious. (laughs) Oh, my God. What? That is some serious malignant narcissism. 
Yeah. That is mental illness combined with power. That is so funny. Yeah. The personal insult that people would want to vote. Yeah. Not the, even, <laughs> that like that's like that they might want to dis- decide the path of their country and life is like them shitting on you. There's also just so many crooked democracies. Like yeah, sure, 98 percent of the populace voted for this one person. Like just assume that mm-hmm. you could set that up. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's it's, so funny. It's great. Uh, uh, my tubby son is letting people <laughs> vote again. They're letting no. You don't get to choose. <laughs> <laughs> so the French are still on board at this point. They want a strong man in Cambodia who can keep a lid on the communists. So they support King Sihanouk while he arrests nine members of the Democratic Party and, imp- and imprisons them without trial for plotting against the state. I mean, for state. A colonial power, the more brutal your dictator, the better. You don't really that's give a shit what worked. happens on the ground. As long as there's only the one thing worked. happening. Yeah. yeah, I can't think of a single time where a colonial power backed a dictator and didn't have things work out great. Well, it works for the colonial power. I'm not saying it works in the sense that's like, yeah, a knife works for a murderer. Murder's not cool. That's not what I'm saying. It worked for us in Vietnam. If you are France, it makes sense to prop up a brutal dictator because that prevents anything from changing, period. You don't care how brutal it is. You just don't want it to change. And that right there is why all of the colonial powers are still in charge of their colonies. Well, that's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't say it works in the long term. There is no long term success. There's no long strategy. con for That's colonies. That's why it doesn't work. <laughs> no. Yeah. So you're right. The French are doing exactly what you'd expect the French to do. Sihanouk disbands student organizations that had any kind of political bent. Uh, he also attacks the heads of the two Buddhist monastic orders uh, who had protested against him for sympathizing with the rebels. He says, quote, for the first time in my life, I have to grab the monks by the throat. Me, the most religious man in the kingdom, because I've had enough, more than enough. My subjects and the elite among my subjects must obey. So shortly thereafter, right after this, uh, with his kingdom in a state of unrest and outright civil war in some sections, Sihanouk flies to France to drop some pounds. So when you read about this guy in any of the history books, it'll regularly talk about him leaving for France to his house in the Riviera to take what's called a rest cure or a dietary cure, which I I, I thought it was because you hear like terms like that a lot old with old timey leaders where they're taking a rest cure, which is just like they're taking a vacation. Yeah. But they don't want to say they're taking a vacation. So it's like a cure for him. It was a weight loss clinic. So he would go to France regularly throughout his reign when he got too fat to go to a French weight loss clinic and drop pounds. So that's basically what he's doing. Like he he cracks down on all political dissent. He arrests a bunch of people, uh, and then he goes to goes fat to camp. fat camp. Yeah. yeah. So he's a great he's a great great guy. Uh, this would be a pattern, yeah, for the king for his entire life. So after fat camp, the king flies over to Paris and he meets with the French president and gives him a list of demands. He wants full control of the Cambodian military. He wants French people in Cambodia to be subject to Cambodian law. And he wants a guarantee of eventual uh, independence for his country. All of which, those are reasonable things for the head of state of a country to ask of another country who just took them over to get cheap rice, I guess. Um, Yeah. Well, again, it's for a strategic cult, like a position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted to, yeah. They They have so much more than rice. Like they're really good at, like, yeah. you know, part of the reason that they're satisfied is because what they have is really good. Yeah, yeah. The the people there are satisfied. The French are not satisfied because um, colonialism isn't working out for them. It's one of those things you'd think, like, after they stopped being in constant conflict with, with Britain and, like, Germany got sort of cut down to size by the Second World War and they, they'd stop, like, what do we have all these colonies? Like, what's what is what about this? Like, everyone else has stopped playing the game. The game's well, not going on. It's a different world now. They, that process all started after World War One, when at the end of World War One they rewrote the lines to figure out how to share stuff because they had spent centuries taking it over. And yeah. what they learned is you don't get to let it go. You can't like it's all over your hands. It's not it, you're grabbing a gel, not a solid. You don't yeah. get to pull it away. So they were stuck with it, and they propped up all these dictators that we're talking about now and sham governments. And it's just a plan that it, there was no option other than for it to fail. There's yeah. no way to end the history that started evil, not evil. Yeah. So and you're watching the gasps of, of colonialism, you know, fade away. But why were they doing this? They already answered that question. They shouldn't have, you know, <laughs> they were trying to not do it. There's just no way to undo it once you start fucking the whole world. Once over, you conquer the fucked. whole world for 150 years. Yeah. Well, for, yeah. Yeah. For- well, yeah. France, France, I think, had been uh, in control of this part of the world since like the 1860s. Um so yeah, they've they've been here a little while. 
um, which is why all of their government documents at this time are in like French and stuff. Mm -hmm. But to his credit, King Sihanouk uh, at, at no point thinks that colonialism is anything but fucked. Um, like when the French are fighting against the Vietnamese, he's like, you guys are going to get your butts kicked. And when the Americans get involved, he's like, this is not going to work <laughs> for anybody. Like he knows that from the get go. So credit where it's due, he is smarter than all of the Europeans in this story, which maybe isn't the highest bar in the world. <laughs> uh, they're not sending their best people to uh, to run their countries anymore. Um, so yeah, the, he goes to the French president and he's like, uh, I want you know my country's independence and full control of the military, yada, yada, yada. The French president's like, LOL, no. Mm -hmm. So CNN flies to the US to see if we would back him in his quest for independence. Uh, he meets with the Secretary of State, Alan Dulles, uh, who was like, if the French army leaves, you're going to all be taken over by communists, and we can't have that, so just be cool with the French being there. Uh, the president refused to meet with him, but White House officials coordinating his trip did offer to take the king to the circus, which he took as an insult, which wouldn't you? I mean, honestly, yeah. yeah. The president can't hang with you, and we're not inviting you to dinner, which we always do with heads of state. <laughs> But there's a circus in, in town. Have you ever seen elephants? I guess you have. <laughs> you have we stole these elephants Cambodia? from Come you. Come look at yeah. our carnies. Yeah. yeah, we stole these elephants. Look at these elephants we took from you and some carnies. <laughs> elephants just telegraphing, take me home. It would be great if these he stole carnies and brought carnies back to Cambodia. Just that's the, cu the cultural exchange he yeah. wants to make. We steal the elephants, they steal carnies. <laughs> I don't, that is not an even trade. No, Aim but higher. that's a solid screenplay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, um, this made Sihanouk angry, uh, the French and the Americans both ignoring him. He gives an explosive interview to the New York Times where he threatens America that Cambodia will go communist if it's not given its independence. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, he repeated the basic idea a few months later in a memorandum he sent to both the Americans and the British. I am asking the USA and Great Britain if, just for once, they will kindly consider the problem of Cambodia from the viewpoint of the Khmers instead of that of the French. My people will tell you, we don't know what communist slavery means, but the slavery imposed by the French we know well, for we are now living under it. So, one of the weird things about this guy is when you read the things that he says to his people, he comes across as a total dick. And when you read everything he's saying to the colonial powers in the US, he's like, Totally reasonable. Well, like, you guys are ignoring what everybody here wants and just trying to do your own thing, and it's going to be a fucking disaster. He's like, yeah, right. But then when he talks to his own people, it's like, dissent will be crushed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in June of 1953, Sienna, Sienna makes his play for Cambodian independence and absolute power. He secretly goes to Bangkok, and he announces that he won't return to the capital or talk to French officials again until they agree to set his country free. If we cannot obtain what we want peacefully, the entire Khmer people are resolved to obtain their freedom by other means and are ready to sacrifice their lives. So a few days later, uh, this prompts the two largest Buddhist orders in Cambodia to call for a holy war against the French. The next day, Sihanouk calls for Khmer units and the French army to desert. At the end of the month, he called for all citizens between 20 and 35 years of age to join the fight for independence. So the French military in Cambodia basically dissolves overnight because the king told them to leave, and he's like the fucking semi-divine figure. So the French realized that like they just they can't hold the country without this guy who they'd basically been treating as a big toddler the entire time. So by October, they've had enough and they agree to relinquish all military control of Cambodia to the king. It'll take another year for France to totally pull out of their former colony, but King Sihanouk had done it. In November of 1953, the French handed over total control in a dumb and self-aggrandizing ceremony where they like Basically, they phrase it, they frame it as like a graduation ceremony. Like, yeah. you people are finally ready they to control to your own shit. country. Yeah, it's the key. Yeah. <laughs> that you ran for thousands of years yes. before we came in here. Uh, but yeah, all's well. Uh, Cambodia is independent. The yoke of colonialism has been cast off, and uh, the communists are not in charge. So it seems like things are going great for Sihanouk now. And probably nothing terrible will happen in this story. But yeah, I, that's the end of the podcast. This was really fun. I'm yeah, not sure why yeah. this guy was such a bastard. S story I mean, it started kind of bad. That, that yeah. crushing descent was kind of rude. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, all right. Uh, but no, actually, that is that is a, a lie. Oh, uh, it didn't go good? It didn't go good after that? Well, we'll get into that after we sell some products and or services. Do you like products and or services? I love both products and services. And you know what else I love? Exchanging money for them. Oh, yeah. I. You know what I love is producing value for shareholders, which is then hand to me in a fraction that I can I can spend on my own products and services, which create value for other shareholders. What do you know? So let's all do that right now. And we're back. 
we are talking about King Noradom Sihanouk, who has just succeeded in wangling freedom for his country from the French colonial uh, oppressor pig dogs. Uh, so it seems like all's great, except for everything isn't great. Uh, Sihanouk's triumph led to an immediate and bloody escalation of the fighting in Cambodia. The rebels, under that Than guy we talked about earlier, argued that the prince was basically a slave of the French. Uh, they claimed that his friendly relations with them were proof that he was just a figurehead, and he was going to send Cambodians over to die in Vietnam. Uh, so yeah, uh, the fighting continued, and it turned out that Sihanouk wasn't all, actually all that good at war. By the middle of 1954, he'd lost about 40% of his territory to the rebels. Uh, the fighting was bloody enough that nobody wanted to really keep killing, and in May, a rebel representatives and the king traveled to Switzerland to talk it out with a bunch of other countries, including Vietnam, the U.S., and for some reason, Canada. <laughs> There's other countries there, too. Canada was just the one that made me go, what, what, why is, what is Canada They're doing? really good at apologies. Yeah. So this is right around the time, you know, you had, you had North Vietnam and North Korea had already been established at that point. And so the, the Khmer rebels in the north are like, we want our own separate country. We don't want to be ruled by the king. We want our own, like, legit democracy and stuff where we can, you know, choose our own path without this king doing whatever the hell he wants. And, yeah, so that's their hope going into this, going into this session. The rebels begged the Soviet Union and China to stick up for them, um, but the U.S. did not want what they assumed would just become a separate communist Cambodia above regular Cambodia, and the Soviet Union and China weren't willing to fight for the Cambodians. So everybody works out an agreement where the rebels will lay down their arms and elections will be held in 1955. It sounds like Sihanouk wins this one, but everybody knew that once the elections were held, the Democrats, which were you know, heavily backed by the rebels, would win. And their most popular candidate would be Than, the guy who'd been leading the rebels. So this would have left Sihanouk as the constitutional monarch of a government that hated him and was definitely going to do whatever it could to turn him into just a figurehead. So the U.S. is happy with this because it means that, unlike everywhere else in Southeast Asia, a country was about to happily vote for a democratic government. They actually liked Than. He was pro-U.S. So they're like, this is a great thing for us. You know, we've, we've established a democracy in Southeast Asia Let's wash our hands and walk away. But Sihanouk is not happy. Letting people choose who they wanted to lead them basically ran against all of his deeply held convictions, most of which were that he should be the guy in charge of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So in February of 1955, after this agreement is made and the rebels lay down their arms, the king calls a referendum on his royal crusade, you know, the thing that freed Cambodia from the French. And mm -hmm. he's basically asking the whole kingdom to vote, do you like me, yes or no? <laughs> Voters were told, quote, if you love the king, choose a white ballot. If you don't love the king, a black ballot. Of those voting, 99.8% chose white ballots, saying they loved the king. Uh, but the turnout was really low. Not a lot of people it's super like care to vote. like 98% of he and his mom. Yeah, yeah. 100% <laughs> of him and his mom calls him oh, fat. Oh, 98. Yeah, yeah, yeah mom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a few days later, um, you know, he, he's kind of fuming over the low turnout and he's fuming over the fact that all the polls are saying the Democrats and this guy he doesn't like then are going to win the election. And he winds up renting a house next to a big gathering for the Democratic Party and like listening into one of their speeches and it ends and there's this huge eruption of applause. And according to people who were there with him at the time, he starts weeping with rage when he hears how popular the Democrats are. So he's desperate and his fragile, that's, fragile ego. Huh? That's some more schoolyard shit. Yeah. Hearing people cheering for like someone, someone else, else on the dodgeball court. <laughs> They're not like, even ah! angry at you. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's not enough to be a beloved king. Like the fact that anybody else is liked is just burning him alive. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's desperate and his fragile ego can't take being sidelined by some popularly elected uh, politicians. So on March 21st, the king makes a surprise broadcast. Surprise! Oh, yeah. Oh, not like a fun one, though? It's not like a birthday party? You tell me. I'm going to read the broadcast. My enemies work against me ceaselessly. And I, I should note that anytime there's a me in here, it's spelled with the M capitalized. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, royals. <laughs> Nothing like that will ever happen again, and certainly not in our own country. I, I will say, this could almost be a tweet yeah. from our current yes, it could. president. Yes, um, close your eyes and listen and just pretend. Certain of our students who love injustice are determined to serve the Democrats and Sun Nok Than. The educated, the highly placed, and the rich spend their time throwing up obstacles to my work for the sake of their own interests and ambitions. All of this has completely discouraged me and prevents me continuing to reign. If I remain on the throne, I will be unable to work in your interests. My poor and humble subjects, freed from my golden cage in the royal palace, I offer my life and my strength to my people. For though I leave the throne, I shall not shirk my duty to serve. So the king abdicated. 
he throws down his you his office. You can't fire me. I quit. Yeah. Well, the king abdicates. Uh, he has his dad become the new king after him because you know kings and shit. Yes, I that's, guess that's usually how, that how works. they do that. So now he's a prince and a private citizen, and he's free to run for election against the Democrats. So he creates his own political party. He calls it the People's Community, so it would sound like a socialist party, even though it wasn't. Uh, All the conservative Cambodians instantly dropped their parties and they flocked to the prince's banner, along with more than a few of the Democrats, because, hey, the prince is popular. The prince's party, Sankum, makes a formidable rival to the Democrats, but the king had misjudged a little. His party had no policies and no plans. Its only stated goal was blind support of Prince Sihanouk. So... Uh, I love that you go, like, as a leader of the party, you go from, like, being actually king, and then when you're running for office to be essentially a king, or like, you know, a, 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 an executive leader, you get to the, you get, to, you get up to make a speech, and you're like, I don't know, my plan? Don't you just call me king or prince? Doesn't it just become pre- I still just go to fat camp, right? I want to be president, My plan prince. is to go back to fat camp, just like it was. <laughs> It's eerie how well you've predicted this. <laughs> so Cambodian... He's probably stress eating a lot right now. I'm just saying. Oh, God. He must be. Just baguettes all day long. Oh, man. Just pouring Amazing chocolate sandwiches. on them and crying. How could you not? If, how, if I was literally... <laughs> if I was like a Cambodian king, I would be like a feudal lord just walking from like street food cart to street food cart. Like, I've come for my offerings. <laughs> Chicken and rice and tea immediately. I will have the duck as well. well yeah, so that was, that's... This is a mark of the kind of man he is, because he could have legitimately lived that life where he just is rich and beloved and gets fed forever, and he could just walk around letting people give him things. That could <sighs> be his whole life. But instead, he wants to be in charge, which only crazy people want. That's true. Only um, crazy people actually want power. Yeah, so the king's party has no policies and no plans, uh, and even with the king's popularity, the Democrats are still slated to win a lot of the seats, and so he's not going to be in absolute power. You know, He's going to have to do a coalition government and be a democracy. The king wants no part in that. So five weeks before the vote, he uses his control of the police and military to launch a massive intimidation campaign against the Cambodian left wing. He has the authors of communist and lefty journals and newspapers imprisoned. Several far-left candidates are outright murdered. King Sihanouk uses the unrest from his repressive tactics to justify a heavy police presence at the voting stations. So he starts arresting people. That leads to protests, which he then uses as evidence that he needs to fill the polling locations with police and soldiers. (laughs) Uh, Left-wing voters who were brave enough to go vote were handed colored voting slips, each color representing a party, and they didn't have to put the slip into an urn while officials, police, and soldiers watched them. So, voter turnout was not great among the Cambodian left wing, Uh, but the king still did not do very well, so he had his minions just lie about the vote count. In constituencies where his party's candidate finished second, they just outright destroy all the voting slips and murder the winner. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Very simple. So there's a lot of, like, when he, the king, spoiler alert, died in 2012, I think, and when you read the obituaries about him, uh, they're mostly positive in like Western newspapers, and they'll all talk about like <laughs> that. None of them are even consistent about how much he won by. They'll all say between eighty-four and ninety-nine percent of the vote, <laughs> which is like. But nobody. It's frustrating because like the Telegraph or someone will be like reporting on this and say like, and he won election with ninety-nine percent of the vote. No, he didn't. <laughs> like, yeah, he murdered people. The newspapers and like the well. The journalism in colonia, like colonizers' nations, have yeah. a really hard time actually reporting on why. Like the who, yeah. what, when, and where is is not that hard. But why these things are happening kind of eludes, like you know, yeah. even even still. But I imagine especially the reporting at the time is a little clueless. Yeah. About the well, about you know the what? why. The weird thing is the reporting at the time when he wins this election, the foreign journalists who are in Cambodia uh, cry foul at the obvious cheating. Like they're like, this is clearly fucked up. Here's all of the different like right. things that went wrong that were wrong. But the international community sticks their fingers in their ears. So the Americans and the French are just happy Cambodia didn't go communist. And they're right. kinda like, Don't like who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck if this country that's not America has a prince dictator now? So the whole mess led one Cambodian voter to conclude Taking part in elections is just for propaganda. An election is a power struggle. The one who has power in his hands is the one who controls the outcome. You want to guess who said that? 
Oh, come on. That's our little buddy. One guess. That's little. It's got, he's got a pot and a pole. It's yeah, Pol Pot. Yeah, that's our little buddy Pol that's Pot. That's about as cute as I could make that's our a little Pol buddy. Pot reference. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of his little origin story here. You shouldn't get here. a fun name if you're a dictator. You shouldn't get, you shouldn't get something fun to say. It should yeah. be clunky. It's hard. I am already ashamed. I keep calling the prince the prince because I am intimidated about getting names wrong. Period. Sienna, I'm and I, I and Sienna, apologize. I've written to down any... it. I've written it down phonetically all over my note card. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still gonna call him the prince. And yeah. Pol Pot is just so it shouldn't be fun to say. No, it shouldn't. And he has the cutest name of any. He does. Person he has the cutest name. Yes. Of yes. Yeah, In terms, sure. I mean, 100%. the list is pretty short. Yeah. But uh, Chairman Mao. Pretty cute name because it makes me think of cats. Sure, yeah, yeah, but the chairman part, real heavy. Yeah, That's the real chairman heavy is not front. a cute name. Yeah, whole pot branding is real sharp. Yeah, yeah, clean. You know, and that's, the, you got to give credit to the communists. Their branding was on point at this period of time. In this period of time. Yeah, yeah. But that slipped. Yeah. They, they t- paid less attention to the aesthetic as time went on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. Uh, so, yeah, Pol Pot, uh, at the time of this election, is working uh, for, the can- for the Democratic Party. Um, so he's he's working for the Democratic Party, but he's also an officer in a secret underground Cambodian Communist Party. Uh, Pol Pot and his fellow communists did want to change Cambodia's system of government, but prior to the election, they hadn't wanted a violent war, an overthrow or anything. So Mao Zedong, who was basically like the most respected sort of communist philosopher in, mm-hmm. in Asia, uh, had laid out a theory of how to flip countries like Cambodia, who were feudal or colonized nations that didn't have a big laboring class. Um, and he, it was like how to flip them to communism without bloodshed. Um, so first you needed a democratic revolution where peasants and workers and the bourgeoisie all worked together to supplant the king, kick out the colonizers, and gain a democracy. And then Mao said you'd have a normal democracy for decades probably, for a very long time, and it would be capitalist, and that would be that would be fine. And basically the left would gain power gradually over time as people saw the flaws in capitalism until everyone just agreed that communism was a swell idea and you had a peaceful transition to communism. Well, that worked, right? Well, that's what these guys were wanting to do. So Pol Pot, as a young man, right up until this election happens, believes in the democratic process, thinks it's a necessary step on the way towards making the country the way he wants to be, and doesn't want there to be any fighting in his country. Um, you know, they, they would have been happy with the Democrats winning power and, you know, then just voting for a while. But Dude. when Sihanouk really? cramps... Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm gonna, just before I, I hear about the rest of this, I'm going to say that if you are a guy who kills a million and a half people, be you a prince or fighting against a prince in a democratic party, that's in you before you get that power. You don't care how you get it. You're a, a, you're a sociopath, so you don't have any moral connection to what you're actually spewing. You just collect and want power, influence, whatever it is. If you, this guy would have, you know, again, if he was just a bad assistant manager, he would have killed everyone in his Arby's. Like, it's, yeah, I feel like these seeds were already planted. Pol I feel Pop like- and and the prince are uh, the same evil born in different soil. I feel like the seeds are there, but I don't feel like they're necessarily getting watered. Like, you've got, I think Pol Pot, for one thing, he's a little different than, like, he's not like a guy like Hitler. So you get a guy like, like, you've got kind of these two different theories of how to look at history. There's trends and forces, and then there's like the great man theory. And like, it's probably a mix of the two, but you look at like in Germany after World War I, there was going to be another fight between France and Germany because of just how the whole thing fucking ended. Yes. Somebody was, some strong man asshole was gonna take charge of Germany. But because it's Hitler, you have the Holocaust and the invasion of like Russia and whatnot. And I think Pol Pot is more like George right psychopath, w. right time. Huh? Interesting. Huh. Well, he kind of, he like certain things, like there was because of the shit the prince is doing, because he's clamping down on oppression, because he's he's giving the left no legitimate way to win power, there was going to be a left-wing revolution in Cambodia. And it was worse than it would have been because Pol Pot is the man he is. But I think the prince made it inevitable that this was going to happen. I think him crushing all dissent and me, because like, a guy, like maybe Pol Pot always would have been an asshole, but there's like, like it, it it's it's I don't know, it's hard to say because like before this time he's like driving around in a in a nice car and he's like dating like rich ladies and like wants to be like he, he doesn't seem to want to murder three million people at this point in his life, and I guess you know it's it's debatable as to what would happen, but I don't know, I don't know, if you're the person who can do that, that is in you. 
And no moral compass, no philosophy you espouse is greater than whatever synapse fires that lets you kill a million people. But I, I, I feel like that synapse is there. You're absolutely right. But I don't know that it necessarily leads to you. Because there's got to be... We've probably keep... all worked with someone who, if they gained power, could kill yes. a million and a half people right. or whatever. Yes. But instead, they're a stand-up comedian because yes. like, that's just the way life goes. <laughs> I just think of I mean, a Jim Jones who was like... You know, his politics, if all you did was list out Jim Jones' politics, you'd be like, well, this sounds like a person I probably agree with on most things. Mm. And then you're like, oh, but cult leader who killed, who just killed, who yeah. killed everyone. Because it's the, you're, you know, it's interesting when uh, the sh- you agree with the shell of someone and then on the inside is this horrible, evil thing. So I feel yeah. like even if Pol Pot was like, no, I'm a good guy. I don't believe in colonial power. I want justice. It's, yeah. No, you're somewhere in you. <laughs> someone is going to kill Yeah, a that people. guy was always yeah. in here. But I do, I take your point though, yeah. that because, uh, you know, the prince set in motion something that, uh, you know, uh, you couldn't stop and Pol yeah. Pot is who he is. So it was that. Well, and you're looking at Cambodia prior to this. It's not a country where most people are biting at the whip to like revolt against the system that exists. Mm-hmm. But uh, that starts to change after the prince, you know, brutally suppresses the left wing and essentially makes himself president prince, mm-hmm. um, which is you know, oh, president I, prince is like an alternate universe. I would love to live in. Exactly. We both pictured exactly what yeah, that would exactly. be like: chapless purple pants and, and like the White amazing. House is like all Technicolor because mm-hmm. it's like white, but you put the colors of laser show and shit. You know what? Great. No one would have died in the war for oh, Afghanistan, God. and it would be so much Everyone more colorful. Could dance yeah. so well. Mm-hmm. Oh man! Woo! Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for taking me there. Okay, president, please continue. Yeah. 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 God. Can you imagine the things he would have done to the White House bowling alley? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it would have been a discotheque, and it would have been fucking incredible. God, that cabinet. Yeah. Fire. Okay. Uh, well, now that we're all happy, let's that get back good, to talking right? about- okay, yeah, yeah, let's get back to talking about Cambodia uh, in the mid-50s. Pol Pot decides that democracy's bullshit, and shortly thereafter takes to the jungle with all of his friends and comrades to do a uh, jungle communist shit. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Sihanouk is largely backed by conservatives, but he himself is not a conservative or a leftist. He is a himist. His only guiding moral principle is that he should be in charge of Cambodia. So he doesn't really give a shit about politics. He just wants to be the guy. Uh, He's a smart guy. He knows that Cambodia is going to eventually go full communist. He knows the number one power in the region, China, is already communist. And he knows the United States is going to eventually get fed up with sticking their dick in the whole area and leave Vietnam. So he figures that his main worry is the Vietnamese. Uh, They have a history of bullying Cambodia, and they're the main backers of the Cambodian communist movement. So Sihanouk comes up with a pretty clever plan. He will let the Vietnamese use his country as a highway for their guns and money, first to fight against the French and then the U.S. He'll even let tens of thousands of them hide in Cambodia when the fighting isn't going their way. But they have to stop giving guns to and training the local Cambodian communists. Obviously, this pisses off the United States. So Sihanouk's promise to them is that he'll brutally repress the communists in Cambodia. There so you in- go. One hand washes the other. Exactly. That's how you do it. That's how you brutally dictate. Exactly. So in foreign policy terms, he's in lockstep with the USSR and China. But domestically, he's doing like a triple McCarthy and like everything, like killing all the communists yes. in his own country. So Norodom Sihanouk is the only guy who was simultaneously on both sides of the Cold War for the entirety of the Cold War. Dancing, like, dancing, 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 and dancing, and dancing, and dancing. Watch the royal court fall down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we are, uh, yeah. So the prince's father served as king when the prince first abdicated. Uh, when he died in 1960, the uh, Sihanouk's mom, Queen Kosamak, wanted to be crowned. But, you know, his mom had spent his whole life calling him fat. So right. the king flips the script on his mom uh, and makes her guardian of the throne, which is a position with no power, and uh-huh. instead pushes through a constitutional amendment to make himself head of state for life. <laughs> so now, by 1960... He is the president and the head of state for life. And that is where we are going to end the podcast for today. And we will be back on Thursday to talk about the rest of Sihanouk's wacky career, which is, I mean, it's going to get dark. I bet we're going to hear about some infrastructure improvement. I bet Mm -hmm. we're going to hear a lot about like... uh, Robert's rules and how it was mm-hmm. implemented. Are you, you know. calling water filtration plants? Oh, heck yeah. Because I got nine pages of water filtration plants to I talk so about. I am so looking forward to that. Beer rock, grassy. Beer rock, grassy. That's what's coming, That's right? That's a good chant. That's a good chant. It's definitely not like death, destruction, and horror. I mean, 
See you next time. Uh, not yet. See you next time because we have a uh, we. Uh, you should plug some things before we uh, we roll out for the day and a half between the next podcast. I right am now. Caitlin Gill, and I have a website. It is called CaitlinGillComedy.com, and you can go there, and then you can see my schedule. It's a tab. You click it, and then uh, there'll be a little calendar. You get tickets to any of my live shows. Also, July 11th, Misfits and Monsters comes out on True TV. Watch it. Uh, I'm Robert Evans. I don't have any live shows, but I have a book. You can buy it on Amazon. It's called A Brief History of Vice. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at I Write OK. Uh, two letters and uh, this show Behind the Bastards is also on the internet www.behindthebastards.com you can also find us on social media at Bastards Pod so uh, check us out uh, we'll be putting sources and images up so that you can sort of follow along and get the visual picture of the story and we will be back on Thursday with part two of this particular Bastards tale <laughs> <laughs>